Hello, everyone, and welcome to Exploring Entrepreneurship, Co-Founders We Are on May the 4th. Our program today is a part of Small Business Week, a collaboration of several Austin nonprofits and government entities hosting a full week of no-cost classes, panel discussions, and legal and business assistance to support the amazing small business ecosystem here in Austin. My name is Janice Omadecki, and I'm delighted to be your moderator today. I'm an Austin Young Chamber board member and CEO and founder of The Mentor Method. Exploring Entrepreneurship is a partnership between the Austin Young Chamber and the City of Austin Economic Development Department's Small Business Program. The Austin Young Chamber runs many programs throughout the year that promote business and talent development, entrepreneurship, civic engagement, and community growth. Keep an eye on the Austin Young Chamber website and their social channels for additional programs, pitch competitions, and topics to support your business. And if you're not a member, consider joining to receive year-round benefits for your business. We are so pleased to be able to work with the City of Austin to bring forward several programs that support early stage startups and small businesses here in Austin. To start, please join me in welcoming Jacqueline Mayo with the City of Austin Economic Development Department's Small Business Program to share a few words. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the, uh, the Entrepreneurship, Exploring Entrepreneurship panel discussion. We are co-founders, are we, I believe. Um, my name again is Jackie Mayo. I'm the Class and Events Coordinator for the City of Austin's Small Business Division. and um, it is a pleasure to be here with you to sit in on this panel discussion. Um, I want to thank the Austin Young Chamber for hosting this event and hosting it during National Small Business Week. Um, they are a fabulous partner and we enjoy working with them on a regular basis. Congratulations to all the panelists. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing your uh, discussion this morning, afternoon. I also just want to reiterate, I just would like to reiterate, I'm sorry about that. I thought I was unmuted, but I guess I wasn't. And I'm just talking to myself. I apologize. Um, thank you for being here. Um, I hope that you will take the opportunity to go to visit our website at www.smallbusiness smallbizaustin.org and take a look at all the classes that we have offered this week that are free. Um, there's something out there for everybody, whether you're a startup um, or you're an existing looking to grow and expand. Um, I believe we have something for everybody, cooperatives, nonprofits, you name it. So take a look. We have a, a great, great um, plethora of classes and variety of them. Um, Thank you again to the Austin Chamber for inviting us here. And um, I look forward to our panel discussion. Thank you, Janice. It's no secret that the Austin startup scene is booming thanks to our numerous higher education institutions, accelerator programs, incubators, entrepreneur ecosystems, and the hundreds of new Austinites coming to our region every day. In today's discussion, we will take a deeper dive into the relational aspect of starting a business as we look at business partnerships and hearing from those who are in it now and learning some do's and don'ts from a legal perspective to guide us. Very important facts. Today's format will include a 45-minute panel with our panelists followed by 30 minutes of roundtable networking. As we start the panel, if you have any questions for us, please drop them in the Q&A tool so we can answer questions at the end if we have time. And feel free to be active in the chat with fire emojis, clapping, or plus one if you love what you hear. So with that, let's get started. I will kick this off by introducing our incredible panelists through their brief bios. First up is Anna Estrada. Anna is a small business attorney who enjoys helping people interested in starting their own small businesses or who are already self-employed. She provides business formation assistance, commercial contracts, document drafting and review services, and general advice and counsel. 
As someone who works with everyday people in need of guidance, Anna values her role as both an educator and a counselor. Ariel Lee is a designer, entrepreneur, and student of the world. She's also a co-founder of Remain, a data-driven platform that is pioneering the personalized hair care space. She is a leader in the beauty tech space and uses her voice to empower underrepresented communities through recognizing the lack of guidance there is within the natural hair care space. She is guiding the infrastructure to disrupt the hair care industry and is passionate about creating equity within communities of color while ensuring that safe products are on the shelf. Fantastic. Last but not least, we also have Christopher Parks who is the co-founder and managing partner at All Pro Hospitality Group, which includes All Pro Hospitality Staffing, International Careers, and the All Pure brand. Parks is a leading hospitality executive with over 20 years of award-winning experience managing luxury hotels, resorts, and gourmet catering operations. He believes in strengthening our community here and abroad through leadership, teamwork, and genuine hospitality. Thank you panelists for joining us today. So jumping into the questions, um, let's, say, let's lay some groundwork about each of your backgrounds in business as it relates to the topic of co-founders and today's discussion. So to start, Ariel, tell us a little bit about the origins of Remain. Who is your co-founder and how did you get started? Yeah, so I got started with Remain when I was a junior in college. I had met my co-founder within a experimental product management course at the University of Texas at Austin called Product Prodigy Institute. And my professor, Ruben Cantu, had basically put us all in groups and asked us to solve a problem that was affecting our community. And within my group, I ended up meeting my co-founder and we both really bonded over the fact that we had struggled along our natural hair care journeys, her having big chopped several times, me having been natural my whole life, but never really thrived and really wanted to re empower others along their journey. And so we got started in that class based off of that passion. And then we started, we just went out and started talking to men and women with kinky curly hair and ended up speaking to more than 500 men and women with kinky curly hair to really understand their journeys that they were going on. And from that, we knew that we had to really create a solution that would help them regain their time and confidence, retain their hair's health, and really reframe the conversation that we were having around kinky curly hair. Amazing, amazing. Next, Chris, similar question. Tell us a bit about All Pro Hospitality Group and your journey with your co-founder. Well, uh, good morning, early afternoon to everyone, and uh, thanks so much for being a part of this um, amazing event. Uh, my name is Christopher Parks, and I'm the co-founder and managing partner uh, at All Pro Hospitality Group, which includes All Pro Hospitality Staffing, all Pro Hospitality International Careers, and the All Pure brand. My business partner is Turgai Yuxo, and we have a combined 50 years experience managing luxury hotel operations, including the Ritz-Carlton and the Four Seasons. All Pro Hospitality Group has a number of divisions that ultimately provide a number of solutions to our hospitality partners with their evolving needs. Excellent, thank you. Now. Anna, you bring a different perspective to this panel. Um, certainly you're a founder of your law firm, but you also have advice. Um, you've also advised many co-founders. So tell us a little bit about why co-founders come to you for help. Thank you very much. Uh, co-founders come to me for help normally for two reasons. One is because they need to get together their initial legal documents to get their business going. And they have questions about uh, setup, formation, a lot of legal questions, but mostly because they need to get, start to put things on paper and to get legal contracts and legal agreements uh, negotiated and signed. 
The other reason that they come to me is because they've run into problems in the partnership. And if they were well prepared, I'm able to help them by uh, reviewing their legal documents and getting them uh, back on track. And uh, there are other times that um, unfortunately, as a transactional attorney, if I'm not able to help them from a transactional perspective, then I will also be able to refer them to a litigation attorney that may be more equipped to handle matters that have spun in a different direction that need court assistance. Follow-up question to that, yeah. thank you. When it comes to the legal documents of setting up a partnership, what would you say are the most important for co-founders to put in place right from the start? Okay, um, this is all gonna really depend on your business plan and your individual business idea. So there could be multiple documents that might be needed. But I would say that at the most basic, the most basic and where I unfortunately see people fail at doing the most basic would be determined by the type of entity that is decided upon and that is eventually registered under which to do business. And most people are eventually going to end up in either in an LLC or a corporation. There are other ways to organize, but I see for the most part, people are going to end up in an LLC or a corporation. And if you end up in an LLC, the minimum you're going to want is a company operating agreement. And that that company operating agreement include a section or clauses dedicated to a buy sell buy sell a transfer of ownership or transfer of interest um so that there is a way for people to get in and get out if necessary and that these are deter these terms are determined at the beginning not when it's time to actually do the buyout or uh, the, or the buy sell if the company agreement does not come with those terms then i would say that then it, there needs to be an attachment that includes this buy sell agreement if you have a corporation, then at a minimum, you're going to want your bylaws and you're going to want your shareholders agreement. And again, that shareholders agreement should have provisions for buyouts. And if it doesn't, then you'll need to have an, an attachment that specifically deals with these buyouts. These would be the most minimum that you would need to have. But again, depending on what your business plan is, then you may need some supplemental agreements. Uh, for example, some management agreements, uh, some agreements that have to do with IP, internet, uh, intellectual property. But um, I would say that operating or doing business without the most basic ones, which are the company operating agreement with buy sell terms, if you're an LLC, or with the bylaws and shareholders agreement, if you're a corporation, would be doing yourself a great injustice. So they are very valuable and they should be done at the very beginning. Thank you. Ariel, you and your co-founder are seeing what you're starting. Congratulations. Um, I feel that there are a lot of big decisions that are being made through that process. So how do you and your co-founder approach decision-making as a team? That's a great question. My co-founder and I, we approach decision-making within, we have certain decisions that are collaborative decisions that must be made together, but there are certain decisions that fall into the different spheres that so I think we break down understanding, first of all, what type of decision is it? Is it a, a decision that requires that we both align and agree or negotiate? And then second of all, what are the spheres that are our own? My co-founder, Diagene Cook, she is she was an MIS major. She deals with most of our data as well as thinking about how um, our systems are structured as well as she is the main builder for our service. So anything that has to do with the technical functioning of how our service works as well as how our data is stored, et cetera, we always defer to her. Anything that has to do with branding, marketing, and those sort of metrics and even the design of the site, um, she defers to me as well as the design systems, et cetera, that I've created. And anything that has to do with the 
where the business is going, um, the administrative part of the business, we handle together and we sit with each other and work through making sure that we're aligned to the most optimal agreement. I think a lot of times people, they are looking to not have disagreements with their co-founder. And I think one of the things that Diajne and I have really centered on with throughout our relationship is understanding that we're not going to agree on everything as we shouldn't, but we have to have really good processes for how we're working through conflict, how we're working through the the things that we're thinking about. Always fight battles that are big enough to matter and small enough to win. And I think we do a really good job of gauging what those are, as well as thinking about how we have conversations with each other about topics that might be harder or we don't necessarily agree on so that we're making sure that we're very logically thinking about our problems and explaining why we feel a certain way when it we're having to align on decisions that may be bigger. So I think that I would always say like go slow and be really intentional about those um, big conversations that you have where maybe it's not within your sphere and y'all have to align and agree on and make sure that you're not just getting quick wins that are are based in ego, but really based in what will be best for you all gelling together and moving in the future as well as y'all's business. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. I have a follow-up question to that because I think you're touching on an important topic, which is having your swim lanes, but also being able to have visibility into the other person's swim lane. So in addition to your co-founder's technical capabilities, how else have you defined those responsibilities? Uh, so how else do you define our capabilities as founders or like together? Could you? co-founders because you mentioned that you have your technical founder so anything related to tech you're like defer to you you've got this so I'm asking how do you determine you know who runs point if there's a big decision to be made sort of how you sort of va value the experience that you both bring to the table and how do you determine who makes the game time decision if that needs to be made right I think that it it's by whoever the decisions domain falls within. Um, so when it comes to most marketing and social things, as well as branding things, I tend to fall point if I'm like, maybe she's not so crazy about the font that I've chosen, but I'm like, this is, this is it. Um, I'm the person that will make the final decision on those sort of things. Although there are certain like, realms in which we have to make decisions together. And I think it is usually whoever has, we just lay out um, our reasoning for why we feel a certain way about something. And we lay out the experiences that the other person has and think very logically about, okay, you've had X experience with these sort of things and you feel this way because of X, X, and X. And we also lay out our non-negotiables. So like what are our posts in the ground that we are like sticking by and this is the rock that we wanna die on. And why do we wanna die on that rock? And what things are we willing to move on so that we can move closer to um, an agreement that is centered. And I think we also set up um, time limits. So we give ourselves a certain time period to make decisions because you can't, you know, just negotiate back and forth forever. So um, we get to a point in which maybe it isn't what one person would have wanted completely, but it's what we mostly want and achieves most of the goals. We'll just, we'll do, we'll make decisions that way as well because sometimes most definitely like I'm the CEO and she is the COO. So when it comes to like vision things and where the company is moving, I hold precedence on thinking about that. But there are a lot of things in which she holds co-precedence on. And I want to make sure that we have fully considered both of our both of our directions. Excellent. Thank you so much for double working on that. I remember when I first started the company, that was something that was always top of mind. So I appreciate that. Now, Chris, 
You and Turjay pivoted your business during the pandemic, branching out from a hospitality staffing company, um, an industry that was hurt hard by the pandemic, to include a CPG product, all pure hand sanitizer. As you come back together to build this new entity in the face of the challenges of 2020 and also 2021, how do you approach the conversations you had to have as co-founders? Great question, and, and thank you so much. Um, so uh, we, we were in a tough spot. Obviously, the whole world's in a tough spot with this pandemic. And, you know, here in Austin, um, uh, it was at South By when South By canceled. It, it, it truly felt that the, the lights were turned off in this city. Um, uh our conversations were centered around supporting our teams. That's always first and, and foremost is uh, just to, to provide um, relentless support to our team uh, by helping them, keeping them informed uh, day to day. Uh, we had to stay very close to our partners. And uh, this time it wasn't what we can, you know, sell to them. It, it was, you know, what we can do for them. And, uh, um, you know, we've done a really great job with staying really close to both our teams and our clients. Um, but lastly, uh, our support to Austin, you know, uh, this city's given us so much um, and uh, we're always looking for ways that, you know, we can further support our great city of Austin. Fantastic. Now, Chris, this is for both you and Ariel. What would you say is the most important thing you did early on or perhaps that you do now in your partnership that has helped your co-founder relationship thrive the most? Beautiful, I mean, great question. I mean, um, you know, I'm very fortunate uh, to find a business partner that shares my values and worth ethic. I think that's so very important. Um, you know, uh, I would like to, instead of just providing, you know, uh, a single most important, there's two things that really resonate with, with us here at All Pro. Uh, first is positivity. Um, you know, as a captain of this ship, uh, you need to dig deep and, you know, pull every ounce of positivity you can from within. Uh, it exists and you just have to go and dig deep. Um, and then you need uh, just be the most positive person you know. It's not something that you turn on and off uh, each day. Um, and the real reason is, is because your vibrations are really felt. So if, if you're just constantly just in the mind frame of uh, being in a positive mind state, uh, those vibrations are just well received. Um, uh, and as I mentioned, it's just not something that you can turn on and off uh, from day to day. Uh, it just always has to be there. And then next is uh, caring. Um, it's the same for employees um, at the best workplaces. Um, they want to feel valued and cared for. And it's the same with leadership. It's the same as entrepreneurship. Uh, once you master these two things, um, I just feel all the hurdles and challenges uh, become easier. I have a question, Ariel, before you answer. I do want to hear your response. But you mentioned, Christopher, about positivity and how that sort of needs to be an ingrained value. I know personally that there are some days, like I'm a pretty optimistic, positive person, but there are some days business-wise where I am ready to flip over my desk, you know, this deal didn't go through or whatever business upset has taken place. And yeah. so while I'm a pretty positive person, I so sure. Um, and how do you make that sustainable for those really tough early stage days that you know can be pretty brutal? So, such a great question, Janice. And, and, you know, life does happen. We're going through some unprecedented times. These challenges that we're facing, we're facing, um, you know, some of these challenges for the first time or second. Um, and when the going gets tough, um, you know, it, you just find ways to overcome, but you know, uh, that's one thing beautiful about a partnership um, is you're there to, you know, uh, pick up on those vibrations and, and see when, when you need to be picked up, you know? Um, and you can just simply just uh, uh, read, read uh, the situation, you know, and then really focus on what you can do to, 
to, um, you know, uh, get through this obstacle. Um, you know, uh, I never said it was easy, but I truly believe if you just look deep within, um, you can find that strength and find that, you know, that next level. Um, simply, it's, it's what it takes to survive these days. And um, you have to be resilient. You have to be full of grit. And uh, at the end of the day, you just got to make it happen. And uh, you want to surround yourself with people that are uh, walking that same path. You on the resilience side of things and then also just having that blind faith in yourself. I think that aligns really well. Thank you. Ariel, please, would love to hear your insights on this question. Yeah, you need to have somebody that you can do hard stuff with. And I always say that like, yeah, you and your partner need to figure out what the the poop sandwiches that y'all are willing to eat and which y'all are not. What pain are you willing to tolerate and which you are not? On your journey, you're going to have difficult things happen and there is going to be like just deals that fall through or opportunities that you don't get, pitches that you don't win. And I think um, understanding how to practice healthy conflict and practicing that healthy conflict and understanding um, how to have those conversations with your partner is so essential. I think that the biggest and best thing that Diajne and I did um, in the beginning was we we invested in each other and we created um, we created psychological safety because when you're working with this person every day, you shouldn't be like, oh, if I tell them this, are they going to get mad at me? You have to have a basis for just being like, I understand you as a human. I appreciate you as a human. I care about you as a human. And then um, you're, you're able to really tap into that deep work with them and get them to do the hard things. Because I think there, it's going to be inevitable that you have bad days. Everybody has bad days. Everybody feels that way, they say. And it's, it's about like not getting letting it get to you. And I think Chris, like, as you were saying, like positivity, I think sometimes positivity cannot be enough. And there are days in which you will go through things. And sometimes you need to have systems set up so that if you say my, my co-founder and I, we call them placemat um, conversations. So when we first started, we said, so like, what does a good day look like for you? What is like when you're working, you're having a great day, like, what does that look like for you? When you're having a really bad day, like, what does that look like for you? Um, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to engage with you? Um, if you need some cheering up, like, what would you like for me to do? How are you motivated? If you, you're doing a great job and I really want to show you and tell you that you're doing a great job. What does that look like? What does that sound like? What does that feel like? And so I think we did a lot of that in the beginning of our relationship so that like when things were off, like my co-founder would be like, ah, get back on the phone. Let's have this conversation and work this out and understand where these feelings are coming from. Because a lot of times the emotional conversations that you have with your business partner aren't necessarily about the business and the real logical decisions that you're having to make, but perhaps um, motivations that you have inside that you just need to work on and express together. And if you're able to get to the root of that problem, then you're able to really... Um, just solve solve really ego deep problems and engage in real deep reflection that will allow you to move on so that you can make and run and you know really jive in the way that you need to be as you're going along your journey and i think those um points have really allowed us to continue working together as well as develop a deep respect for each other because a person that you have a deep respect for you're not going to try and get quick wins or say like oh i was right <laughs> i was right because you, sometimes it feels good and you just want to prove yourself, but in a, a positive, a healthy co-founder relationship, you want to make sure that you both are thriving and that um, you're supported by doing what is best for the company rather than doing what is best for yourself and your own ego. So, yeah. Can I chime in? Can I chime in real quick? Please, because go for it. Beautifully stated. Beautifully stated. And from a legal perspective, when you're in a co-founder situation, you are in what, in a business marriage. You're married. You're in you're in a business marriage. So then you have to realize that you have to treat it as a marriage 
uh, and use all the skills that you can possibly bring to it that you would normally bring to a very important relationship in your life, like a marriage, because from a legal perspective, that's exactly what you're involved in. So you explained it beautifully, Ariel. I think that's a great segue because we actually have a question submitted to us from one of our attendees. And I'd love to hear you um, and a respondent also, Chris and Ariel, um, if you have something to say, please chime in as well. So the question reads, I've come up with an idea and the concept is fairly fleshed out, but there's engineering and prototyping to be done to bring the vision to reality. That's a pretty common situation looking for a technical co-founder. So this person has decided to bring in a partner with working experience in the field of their product who can help take the product from concept to a working design. Their question is, how do they determine what an equitable stake in the company should be for that stage and the support that they need from this individual? Okay, um, I'll start off with, this is not a really legal question, meaning that there is no answer in the law to automatically apply to the scenario. There is no legal formula out there that you can say, this is the situation, what is the legal formula for it? This is much more of a business strategy situation. Now, an attorney can assist you with um, advice on how to tackle the situation so that you can get to that number. But there's no book I can look into. There's no statute. There's nothing in the law that says under these circumstances, you automatically have to give X amount of equity. So uh, the things that an attorney would want to know more about if you to give you some assistance in figuring it out are we well, what is your plans with this other individual besides building you this prototype? Are they going to continue on with the business? after this is built will you are you do you just need them for this portion of things but then after that you're going to want to buy them out uh, or are they going to be people that are going to continue on with management and voting rights for the duration of the business because that will matter as to how you decide um i did tap into my group of people and i got some uh, further things that an attorney would want to uh, consider for as factors um, such as control and vision of the product whether to give equity or to just pay the person like why can't you just pay the person for their services is there a way to arrange that instead of giving equity you'll also want to eventually do determine the value of the services you can we're not going to be able to deal with this issue without knowing what the value of these services are there will be an, has to be an evaluation or valuation process um, what are they asking for? I mean, you could turn around and say, you know, I only want to give you this, but what if they're just, what about their opinion? What if they're not going to get into this for the amount that you're offering at all? So you'll have to take that into consideration, obviously. Um, uh, how long will they need to flush out the idea, monetization of the product, type of entity involved? Uh, is there going to be patent or IP ownership? Um, and uh, what about uh, predetermined buyout options? So that if you're not intending to keep them on as an owner for the duration of the business, definitely 100% in this want to have some sort of buyout provision so that if they do what they have to do, got paid for the they get paid during that time that they can get bought out and then you could continue on without them as a co-founder if that's the plan. So regardless, I can't tell you an amount. I can't tell you under the situation, standard is 20%. Um, there's going to have to be a lot of work still to flesh that out. What does that person want? What are they looking for? But you're going to have to value the services, flesh out some additional matters, um, and then you're going to definitely want to have some buy buyout provisions and whatever documents you have in place.
you for that. Chris, Ariel, anything to add to that question? Yeah, I mean, um, such a great question for all the entrepreneurs that are sitting in and, and taking the time to grow in advance and, and just learn from, you know, some other uh, leadership uh, here in Austin. Uh, it's just amazing. So first, just wanted to commend you for taking the time. Um, you know, it, it, it's a really great question. And, and um, every business and every situation is a little bit different. Um, you know, as Anna was, um, you know, stating, um, you know, always look at, you know, um, here's the thing. When you don't have sales, you're always looking at like, who can I partner up to take me to the next spot? And, um, and without any sales, a lot of times entrepreneurs make the mistake of giving up equity in the company. And, and it's a natural, it's a, it, you wouldn't be the first one to make that mistake or the second or the millionth, you know, um, there's over 38,000 small businesses just in Austin. So, you know, uh, chances are, if you just knock on your neighbor or talk to uh, the person next to you at the coffee line, uh, chances are they're going through the same thing. And, uh, you know, um, um, but with, with no sales, I think a lot of entrepreneurs uh, make the mistake of trying to give away equity uh, just because they're, they're, they really need to uh, get to that next uh, point in their, um, in their business. But, um, you know, uh, all I can say is I, I can, you know, speak uh, upon what's going on right now with our all pure brand business. You know, we, we got an amazing business. Um, but in order to, you know, uh, properly launch, we needed to bring on, uh, some, uh, additional players to our team. And I know Ariel can really attest, um, you know, being in the beauty space, but it's a highly competitive market. Um, you know, um, and, uh, for instance, we need to bring on a CFO, and uh, our CFO, you know, provides uh, governance. You know, it's a very important piece. Someone that can, you know, write up contracts and, and uh, negotiate terms and, and just, you know, uh, be our acting governance uh, with sitting down with major retailers. Um, uh, we needed that legal help. It's not my expertise um, and or my business partner. Um, we needed a, a great CPA. You know, we didn't just need some average person that never had time for us, that couldn't answer our calls and answer our questions. We needed a really good CPA. Um, we need someone, um, you know, to bring the design to the next level, you know. Um, um, but anyways, in regards to our personal situation, we brought on a CFO, uh, but we didn't bring on the CFO as uh, an equity standpoint. Uh, we were able to bring on uh, this CFO um, on a profitability standpoint, you know, and of course, our CFO wants to have equity stake in the company. You know, he wants to invest his time and resources just as we are. But the honest truth is, you know, we really just need him um, from time to time. I don't need him to clock in uh, 20 hours a day like us, you know, uh, but I do need his help, you know, when we're um, sitting down with major retailers and making, you know, big decisions and, um, you know, drawing up performance and, and really trying to map out what tomorrow looks like. But, um, you know, this personally worked for us, you know, I mean, what I saw the CFO's capabilities, yes, we needed, you know, a, a governance and a, an in-house uh, legal team. And we needed um, a CPA that's, um, you know, uh, working hard for us and is able to answer those tough questions. But, you know, uh, we were very fortunate that we were able to bring him on uh, as a profitability standpoint instead of an equity. And that's something that we're able to revisit, you know, 12, uh, 15 months down the road uh, because, um, um, what you'll find is, you know, you might have needed those legal documents in the beginning. You might needed the, a few extra hours of a designer's help. Uh, you might needed, um, you know, an in-house CPA. But all those things, um, you know, can be outsourced um, at an hourly rate. And uh, it, when you're when you're going to commit 80 plus hours of your time week in and week out, um, would you agree that that same person would put in 80 you know, plus hours a week forever and ever? You know, um, and if you if you can't honestly say, you know what, this person's going to be here five years down the road putting in this this type, then I think, you know, it's time to have that conversation with equity. But before that point, it just doesn't make sense. I remember early on in the mentor methods development, we um, we had set up, you know, 
on offshore teams and leverage, you know, bartering with other startups. So if there was a startup that had a creative agency and we had a strength that was foreign to them, being able to sort of cross-reference and share resources was extremely helpful. Um, I do want to be cognizant of time as we're starting to wind down. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. But the last question for today is um, what advice, and this goes with everybody, but Anna will start with you. What advice would you give to co-founders just starting out or even those looking to make adjustments that might help them navigate the opportunities or challenges of working together with a co-founder? From a legal perspective, I would say that the most important thing is for you to have ironed out and in agreement with your initial legal contracts, your initial legal documents. There are, they will save you a lot of problems in the future because they are the equivalent of your prenup in your business marriage. So if problems come up down the road, all you have to do is look at your business documents and a lot of the times the answers appear. So then you can make your decisions and move on and move on with the business matters instead of getting stuck on legal matters, okay? And so in from an attorney's perspective, it's even more important to get your legal documents ironed out in an agreement before you even file or register the business or the name of the business. People are really quick to go file an LLC, file a corporation. They think that that's the beginning and that's what has to get done first. And, and that you could take that and everything from there. From an attorney's perspective, you don't do that. From an attorney's perspective, it's better to make sure you're going to be able to agree to the terms of a company operating agreement. If you can't even agree to the terms of a company operate agreement, why go file for an LLC and waste that money? Not only that, when you register a business, you trigger certain laws that automatically apply to your marriage. You automatically have a marriage and then a certain laws automatically apply. So then you're functioning under these default laws that may or may not be to your convenience or may or may not be what you really wanted to do. So I think it's best to try to get all those things resolved first. And if then you can come to an agreement about how all of this, then you can turn around and file for an LLC or corporation, whatever was decided or wherever was the best thing. And if you haven't done it, if you've already started and you haven't, then to stop everything and go make sure that you guys are still on the same page, because if you are, then it shouldn't be a problem signing onto documents. And if there is a problem signing onto documents, then it's better that you deal with it now than later. Anna, I have a follow-up question. I know I keep doing that, but you're you're all just so insightful that I'm thinking about when I first started the questions that I would have. So to your point on the legal side, if you're early stage and you're either seeking to find a co-founder or starting to sort of explore what that looks like, you may not necessarily have the funds required to afford somebody as knowledgeable as you. Time to forming those agreements and documents, et cetera. Where can people go to get started? Well, um, I will honestly say uh, that it, most business attorneys will charge for an co initial consultation, but between one or two people, they're very affordable and they're well worth the, the, the cost. If you can find someone to give you a free initial consultation, that's great. But I think that whatever the initial consultation is going to be what? I mean, personally, I charge $100 for an initial consultation when you think about it. Right. The, so you have to actually get out of the mind that it's like, oh, it's going to be a $1,000 to even you know, go inside the door of an attorney. I charge $100 for somebody to consultation i give them an hour of my time and then you don't have to hire me to do anything afterwards it's just so they can get all the information that they need so one don't be afraid of going to talk to an attorney for an initial consultation they'll be able to answer a lot of questions and be able to guide you on where to best spend your money at the time so that you're not pouring money into filings and things that you don't maybe don't need at that moment in time until you get your ducks in a row but i will tell you that um you can also go to the people over at score they're not going to give you legal advice, but they will provide you with a lot of great resources and those people are really helpful and 
uh, they'll be able to uh, provide you with further resources if they can't help you with anything there. And sometimes there are small business legal clinics in the community. The reason that I know about this is because I used to volunteer for an organization by the name of LAMP, Legal Assistance for Micro Enterprises Project, and they will provide free legal clinics to the community at different nonprofits. So if you uh, want to jump into one of those, there are only a few times a year, at least locally. But if you want, if you can wait until one of those, and maybe you can jump in because they has uh, several attorneys that go in for several hours, and you can go in. You get a three, 30 minute free consultation. You'll have to have your questions real tight because they only give you 30 minutes. But at least it's talking to somebody about some basics. So there's that. And I think that in the, the beginning, you'll have to understand that you will have to separate some money apart for these documents. But there, th there's a variety of prices that are out there to help you. And you don't have to get a million things done all at the beginning, just your basics. And I think that you'll find that some attorneys are a lot more affordable than you would realize. Oh, that's extremely mm -hmm. helpful. Um, and I can plus one on SCORE. I used that early on in the development of the mentor method, and it made a huge difference. It was free. Definitely leverage those in addition to um, leveraging the small business. Um, Austin Small Business has a list of resources as well. Eric, I would love to hear your closing thoughts as well. Yeah. I think that one of the biggest things that I think entrepreneurs get with, especially in co-founder relationships, especially in the beginning, it's just the cult of personality that is there when working with another person that is just so that can be different from you, that has different goals, different different ambitions. And it's, I think some of the biggest pieces of advice that we give all co-founders is to, first of all, do not get caught up in titles. I think in the beginning when you're like just, you know, forming, you're like a newborn, you're like barely an idea. Don't be like, okay, so you get 2% equity, he gets 12 and I, I get 30, I get 30% equity. Absolutely not. Um, at the beginning, when you're first like kind of forming, storming, norming, performing, you're in that phase, just understand like what it is that you like to do and what are the functions and tasks that it is that you are you, that is becoming like your domain. I think that if you get too caught up in the weed, sometimes even about equity as well as about like, oh, I'm the CEO versus I'm the COO, it can kind of get, you get caught in your feelings when you should really be caught in forming and creating something great so that eventually, um, as Anna said, you can get, you can form an LLC or B Corp or whatever it is that you need. I think my co-founder and I, we only became or filed our LLC um, after we got into our first big accelerator because we needed it legally so that we could protect ourselves. But I think along the way, as like young entrepreneurs, we were just like, it was seemed very daunting but we were able to uh, figure out how to get the money to get the llc as well as file all of the paperwork ourselves and it was pretty simple and straightforward and so i think another piece of advice i would say is like don't be afraid to jump in and try make sure that you're um you know surrounding yourself with mentors and folks who can help guide you along the way but don't feel intimidated because people have done it before you and they will still do it after you make sure that you are standing on the shoulders of giants and looking um looking towards folks who have gone down a path and i think a lot of times when people are thinking about mentors they're thinking about people who are like already living the lives and doing the things that they want to do. I think you and your co-founder should find people who are a few steps ahead of you, um, who might, who are maybe in a similar domain, might not be, but that you admire and are living the lives that you want to live and understand within that co-founder relationship, within that company relationship, uh, the things that they had to do, because that will allow you to more easily backtrack the things that you might need to also be doing in order to keep your relationship healthy, as well as reach the next step of your company's development. Thank you, Chris. 
Yes. I mean, I'm taking up so many notes. I mean, these ladies are, are just uh, providing fire for everybody. Uh, this is just awesome. Uh, such a great question. And thank you for asking. Uh, um, you know, what I recommend first, uh, simply just to take a moment and place yourself in your, your business partner's shoes. You know, don't do this just today. Do it every day. Think about the challenges your partner may face day to day. You know, uh, be there to listen, be resourceful, find solutions together, um, but really try to help beyond uh, the course of business. Um, because once you can work on maybe some of life's challenges, then you could focus on the company's challenges, right? And uh, so you listen and look forward to ways to, to continue to support each other and make each other better. Um, but it, ultimately, it's what can you do to lighten that load um, and be a best friend? Um, this will continue in business um, as you have uh, new sets of challenges from day to day and year to year. Um, be your most resilient self. Uh, setbacks are inevitable and you have to roll with the punches, but the benefits of having a partnership is being able to resolve conflicts together. So I encourage to bounce things off each other, come up with uh, the best solution together as a team, and then move, move forward. Um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, as an entrepreneur, you make the decision to leave, uh, you know, working for someone 40, 50 hours a week to working for yourself 80 plus hours a week. And, uh, um, you know, it's a huge, you know, uh, commitment. Um, and it's going to take every bit of greatness uh, from within to survive. Phenomenal, phenomenal way to wrap this up. So we do have some time for some questions. If anybody has a question, please feel free to the chat or the Q&A space. We want to make sure that this is as valuable for everyone as possible. Give some people some time to put in their questions but i mean this is great i wish that there was a panel like this when i first had the idea for the mentor method um this is very insightful excellent okay we have a question for you anna are you having zoom consults or in person currently i'm having zoom consultations because i'm not fully vaccinated got it <laughs> I mean, for a hundred bucks, yeah, I would gladly, you know, take some time. That's fantastic. Yes, and my point was was to tell you that there's this belief that I can't go talk to an afford attorney because I can't afford one. Like, I, I don't know. I mean, I know a lot of attorneys that are very reasonable. And uh, there are a lot of things that you could learn from them. So even if all you can, even all you do it with an attorney is a, is a consultation, um, the money will be worth it, especially if you both chip in and say, you already have your comps or you chip in on it, 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 it'll be worth it. And, um, for small business people, attorneys know you guys are just starting out so that you, you they'll offer you, for example, I offer little package deals sometimes. So I don't, I want this fear of going to talk to an attorney to go away from people because not everyone that's an attorney is working for, you know, Dell and uh, Samsung and it's just, just outrageous fees. You know, I work with everyday people. You know, I have, I have clients that have come to me one month, didn't have the money to hire me, but wanted to work with me. And then all of a sudden I hear from them six months later, tell me we got the money or I got the money now, but I, I want to work with you. So, there's if there's a barrier I would like to help out with, and that's that you can't fi uh, uh, find affordable legal assistance because there is people out there that can help you and you can afford. I appreciate that. Um, so quick show of hands on the panel. So has anybody participated in incubators or accelerators? Did do you guys use that to help find your co-founders or anything? Nope. Okay, there was a question about incubators to help find business ideas. I was trying to pivot it to the topic of today, which is finding co-founders. Ariel, you're off mute. Would love to hear what you have to say. Yeah, so there are a lot of, you know, accelerators and incubators that can help you find a co-founder. Like I'm in one now called Why Accelerate, Women in AI Accelerate, and it's 
a one for uh, companies who are creating um, algorithmic based or data science based companies and they have a whole thing around like helping people find co-founders and their goal is to help people connect another person to like a technical co-founder within the data science space so um there are definitely programs like that i really think accelerators and incubators they are different and a lot of times like you have to figure out which one fits you based on the stage that you're in and based on what it is that you're looking for all the ones that i have been in have been a little bit later stage to earlier stage idea stage company based ones so i would say it just depends there definitely are ones that are out there and i think it also depends on where you are in your life i don't if you're in university uh, there's a lot of university programs uh, that I know at UT Austin, they do an amazing job with their entrepreneurship minor that they have. Um, they provide a lot of opportunities for students to find each other. Um, and also hackathons. I think hackathons are really underrated. They have three day startup in Austin, which I know provides an opportunity for um, companies and ind individuals, students, regular folk to come together and uh, find people who are also inter interested in entrepreneurship and in three days have the experience of you know creating a or pitching a startup so use hackathons and those type of opportunities to find people who are interested in domains that you're also interested as well as to just test out and try out op try out ideas so i think hackathons are a great way to see how you, well you work with a person in a compressed um amount of time so it's a great way to figure out if you might be able to work with this person long term thank you um chris any any thoughts before we move on to the next portion of the agenda no, this was actually an educational uh, portion for me. I was writing notes as you ladies were speaking because, you know, uh, um, you know, I haven't been a, a part of any um, uh, incubators or, or accelerates. Um, so this was uh, very informative for me. Um, I was very fortunate, you know, um, to work alongside of my business partner. And, um, you know, um, we work for two different luxury brands, but uh, uh, we were fortunate that we shared kind of the same talent pool here in Austin and uh, to support our teams. And, um, you know, we already knew a lot about each other before we actually even first met. Um, so that was uh, something very special about, you know, us. And, um, you know, um, we had uh, um, uh, very different backgrounds and, and similar, you know, work ethic and uh, values. And uh, we just immediately bonded and um, got to work right away. Fantastic. Well, thank you all so much for submitting your questions and a huge thank you. Please click all of the clapping emojis and everything else as a big thank you to our panelists, Anna, Ariel, and Chris. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us today. I know that I learned a lot and I know that the audience learned a lot from you as well. So attendees, it's now time for some networking. So before we let you go, we would love to hear your feedback on today's session. We're posting a link in the chat to our two question program survey. So just two questions, very easy to do. Um, so please click that now and take a couple minutes to share your thoughts. As you're doing that, I just wanted to share what will happen next. So once we end presentation mode, you can move from table to table simply by double clicking on the table you would like to move to. From then, you can turn your camera and mic on, either your camera or your mic, it doesn't have to be both, on um, using the buttons you'll see at the bottom of your screen. Each table works like a Zoom breakout room where you can see and hear people sitting at your table. So this platform will be open for roundtable discussions until 12.45 p.m. Central Time, so about 15 minutes or so. Thank you again so much for joining us for today's Exploring Entrepreneurship Co-Founders We Are program, and we will see you at the tables. <laughs>